We are here with uh, uh, four uh, of our uh, faculty members, and we are going to uh, use this as a way to connect with all of you out there, uh, wherever you are. Uh, obviously, uh, we hope that everybody is doing okay uh, during these extraordinary times. Uh, it's really challenging, not only for the faculty and our students, but for everybody we know. So we're glad that everybody took time uh, to connect with us uh, this way. This is when reunion was supposed to be happening. Uh, we are going to have the usual Friday cocktail hour uh, for uh, the tax program uh, and all our tax alums. Obviously, that's not happening. None of reunion is happening. But we wanted to take this opportunity to connect with everybody in this way that so many of our, uh, our classes uh, are happening right now. Um, and I will just say that this event is not at all what we had in mind originally. Um, uh, but I do think that it is fitting. Uh, I really do want to try to pull the curtain back from a lot of the uh, really wonderful uh, uh, stuff that is happening in tax at NYU. Uh, and this is uh, certainly not anything that anybody planned, uh, but there are uh, more events like this. Uh, we're working on something for uh, uh, next Friday, so stay tuned for another event. Uh, uh, related to the CARES Act that may come together or may not, but keep an eye out for it. Um, and uh, going forward, uh, uh, there are uh, all sorts of things that the tax program is doing. We launched a, a podcast, the Tax Maven, uh, that features at the end of it is uh, a quote from one of our students, uh, a recorded quote. Check out the podcast. If you have a quote you want to send in, you're certainly welcome uh, to do it. Uh, and I will say that uh, next uh, year, uh, is the 25th anniversary of the International Tax Program. Uh, so we can't get together this year, uh, but uh, if uh, fortune favors us, uh, perhaps we can get together a year from now uh, uh, to celebrate another anniversary. Um, so just a few uh, notes about uh, other things that are happening uh, uh, and that have happened quite recently. Uh, so obviously this is the 75th anniversary of the Graduate Tax Program. Uh, founded uh, in the wake of World War II, uh, and um, uh, it's something we are very excited to celebrate with all of you. We haven't been able to do that in person, uh, but we are planning to do that. I don't know, I, I did want to mention, uh, some of you asked for updates on the program and who's here and who's not, what's happening. Uh, Professor Brooks Billman uh, retired a year ago, uh, so we're just thinking of uh, Professor Billman out there, um, uh, who was with us quite recently. So, just shifting gears slightly, um, I do want to say uh, a few things. First of all, uh, I'm Stephen Dean, which I didn't say, <laughs> which is weird, but I should have said that at the beginning. And I'll introduce uh, the rest of our panelists uh, in a minute. Uh, but I did want to say uh, two more things uh, just before we get started. So the, the first is uh, we had a question about uh, interesting, exciting things happening at the program. Uh, and I just want to give you an example of the kinds of things that are happening uh, so uh, Professor David Rosenblum, the faculty director of the International Tax Program, just this past winter uh, started border crossings uh, that is focused on the international provisions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So that is the kind of, that's the, the, the part of what we're doing to uh, build and strengthen and grow. And another question that we had from students that I just want to uh, address up front uh, uh, that I think is, is important, Obviously, this is a challenging time uh, for everybody, uh, but it's particularly challenging for those students who uh, did not manage to secure uh, a position uh, before the pandemic hit. Uh, it is a, a, a stressful time, especially for folks in that uh, position. Uh, but I wanted to give uh, two pieces of good news. I've been in touch with our uh, career services team and the other folks uh, who are helping our students directly. Uh, and I want to share two uh, things that I think should be reassuring and then ask for help. The two things that are reassuring, Clara Solomon is the career services person who handles our students uh, most directly, uh, and she is extraordinarily talented. Uh, she is uh, uh, dedicated to our students uh, and works very hard, and if anybody can help our students in these difficult times, she can. And the other big advantage we have, uh, sort of the program secret weapon, uh, is somebody a lot of you know is uh, our director, John Stevens. Uh, he is, in many ways, uh, our institutional memory. And he was here, of course, during the financial crisis of 08. 
uh, and uh, really is going to be helpful, I know, in steering students through uh, this crisis. So it's a stressful time for, uh, for some students, uh, uh, but we have people here who can help. But I'll also encourage our alums uh, to uh, uh, think of ways to help. There are going to be uh, some alumni events uh, coming, on, coming forward, alumni roundtables that the career services folks are uh, setting up. All right, so uh, please reach out if you're able to uh, help out in that way. So now on, enough with the preliminaries, on to the reason you are all here. You're not here to hear me talk. Uh, so I will introduce uh, the folks who are here. Um, uh, we have uh, four of our faculty here. We have uh, David Kamen, uh, class of 09 uh, and professor of law. We have Noel Cunningham, who is LLM class of 75 uh, and is not only professor of law, but he was for many years uh, the faculty director uh, of this wonderful program. Uh, we also have Lori Malman, class of 71, uh, professor of law, and we have finally Daniel Shaviro, who is the Wayne Perry professor of taxation. Uh, so uh, some of you know all of these fine folks, uh, and all of you know at least one, I would hope, uh, of, these, uh, of these people, otherwise something has gone terribly wrong. Uh, but that is our lineup for today. And I just wanted to share with our panelists, so hi panelists, um, I just wanted to share with you that so many of the folks who are attending and uh, literally hundreds of people uh, RSVP'd uh, and are out there uh, uh, listening to us and we think that's really exciting for me. Um, and I wanted to say two things. So uh, first of all, to recognize those who are not here, uh, John Steinis, who I, I, I dragooned into all sorts of other uh, activities, so I didn't uh, uh, rope him in here, Mitchell Kane. Uh, who is uh, doing wonderful things with the uh, Tax Law Review, uh, bringing it online. Uh, check that out. Uh, uh, the newest edition is available online. Uh, and finally, uh, maybe the hardest working member of our uh, tax team who is not here right now uh, is Professor Batchelder, uh, who has just brought in our newest future tax lawyer uh, into the world, Maya. Uh, uh, wonderful thing uh, in uh, not so great time. So it's good that that's happening. So. Our speakers are here to speak. Uh, I'm here to facilitate, uh, and I'm very excited to um, get started uh, with um, uh, the most junior faculty member uh, on, uh, on our team here uh, tonight. Um, and I wanted to start by asking uh, Professor Kamen uh, a little bit about uh, his experience uh, as a student uh, here uh, at NYU. Um, I, I assume you learned a little bit about tax while you were a student, David? I did. Um, and luckily from uh, some of my fellow panelists here. Um, so, you know, as, as I'm sure so many of the folks um, who are listening in um, have experienced, NYU um, is a really special place to be able to learn tax as a student. And also now that I get to experience it on the other, other side to teach it. Um, and, you know, I remember that from the start, uh, I had Dan for um, 1L tax, I think one of the first times it was taught. Um, and, first time. Yeah, uh, and being able to be in a classroom with um, someone like Dan, who thinks so deeply about the tax law, its undergirdings, like the normative questions that drive, like why we have the system we do, um, was incredibly special. It was also incredibly special, frankly, being you know, the fellow students in that class. Um, I have very strong memory of a number of my fellow students who I continue to have contact with, many of whom went on, a number of whom went on to be tax lawyers themselves. Um, uh, it was a pretty, it was pretty, pretty incredible class. Intimidate, intimidating class, in fact. Um, and, but that, that actually made it exciting. It was a great place to be able to like learn tax, um, to have a professor like Dan um, at the front of the room and a group of students around there who were passionate about it. Um, and with a number of them wanting to pursue it for their careers. So um, I, you know, then uh, an, another key memory for me um, was Noel's class. I think I had Noel for um, a state and gift, if I'm not mistaken. Um, right. Yeah, and so the, the 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 memory that pops off there is the that um, <laughs> is both the class, but then as when I when I had just graduated, um, and I graduated in December um, '09 for reasons we could, or December '08, sorry, January '09 for reasons I can go into. But I was really really lucky. I went immediately um, into the Obama administration and the transition team, and 
we were preparing the first uh, set of revenue proposals from the administration and it, the, the issue of grats came up. And I remember there being a meeting where everyone's like, you know, cause like treasury tech po folks had proposed something on grats and everyone's like, what's a grat? And I pulled open my estate and gift outline. <laughs> it was like, it actually helped. Um, so it was, it was perhaps a scary moment for the government uh, when juniors, <laughs> junior staffer is informing uh, senior members of the government what a uh, policy is based on his estate and gift outline, but it saved me. Um, <laughs> and I think I may have even dropped Noel a note, if I'm not mistaken, back then to try to make, make sure I knew what I was saying. Um, so it was, I, I, I have just such a great memory of like both learning and then quite immediately um, applying it, despite the fact we never actually changed the law when it came to the grads, but we tried. Um, so, uh, you know, th it was that memory of both just being able to learn with like students who are passionate, professors who both saw the nitty gritty detail and then the broader issues that were at stake um, that just made it so such a special place um, and a place I wanted to return to and now feel so lucky um, to be able to teach at. So, thank you, David. I, you know, and I think that's uh, very exciting. I also love that we got a little bit of interaction there. That's, that's great. Um, the next question I have for you uh, is, and again, it's, it's open for everybody to weigh in. I, I, I know that uh, everybody has thoughts, but I'm going to uh, sort of pitch questions in particular uh, faculty members um, uh, loosely. Somebody out there uh, listening to us uh, asked a question about how tax policy uh, can play a role in helping us recover uh, from uh, the ongoing pandemic. You know, we're all tax people. We think of tax as solution to everything. I, uh, but is, is tax a, a helpful way to respond now, David, would you say? So uh, I, I, we, we should definitely have our, our full panel um, responding to this since um, it raises such an important uh, question. So, you know, I think the, a, a way to think about it is, um, is the government's system of social insurance a way to respond to this pandemic? Um, Basically, should the government be stepping in in such a way um, to support families in the immediate crisis, to support businesses in the immediate crisis where um, we're warranted, and then to help support the economy coming out? And I think the overwhelming answer to that, frankly, I think luckily right now among both policymakers and I think academics is yes. Once you answer yes to that question, we can then have a big debate about the details of it, but the overwhelming answer has been yes. There is then becomes a question of the channels by which you will deliver relief. What are the pipelines by which you will get money out the door? And it's actually, it's far easier to write down on a piece of paper in theory how you will do it than to actually get the money out the door in practice. And that was something we experienced when designing the Recovery Act and trying to implement it. And it's something that we're struggling with right now. I think in the, in the face of an immediate crisis, one key design choice and probably um, priority has to be trying to use existing channels, um, existing um, institutions that you think can execute um, on the kind of programs you're designing. Um, one of the key institutions we have that tends to both collect and send money on a regular basis is the IRS. Um, unfortunately, we have underfunded them for now a number of years, and so some of their institutional capacity is degraded because we haven't given them enough money. But if you're looking for a part of the government that has an ability to like send, look, interact with the public and send money, you're basically at Social Security Administration or the IRS. Um, and so I think the IRS has a very large role to play. Um, they've been given some significant responsibilities um, so far, obviously, in delivering checks to most families in the United States. Um, which they're which they're right now um, executing on or trying to or trying to, and you know I think looking ahead, it seems likely that we're going to continue to rely on the IRS and Treasury in trying to execute um, the kinds of supports that families and businesses will need both to make it to through the pandemic and then to hopefully try to support recovery. And so, so Dave, thank you, David. Um, does anybody else have any? Thoughts they want to share on this? Um, uh, Dan, Lori? No, I don't know if people, if anyone's seen, there was a ProPublica story that came out today. ProPublica has been writing the 
doing the exposés and how Intuit uh, has kind of a, a cabal with the IRS where they're allegedly offering free file and they actually uh, trick people into paying money that they shouldn't have to to file. And there's an article by ProPublica today about how partly from that whole system that's in place, uh, people who are poor especially are having a very hard time in some cases getting their checks. Uh, so that's, that's an, uh, an eye-opening argument, uh, not our argument, article, and it shows some of the pathologies in how our tax filing system works now are now having negative effects on this. So I'm giving $1,200 excessively to people who really need it and who need it today. Uh, challenges that are uh, ones we probably should not be wrestling with when we have actual challenges. Uh, any other thoughts from, from the team? Well, the other question is, okay, we all, this panel would agree that we should use existing uh, mechanisms for um, doling out money, right? For paying people and uh, propping up people who need it. Then we're gonna fix, how are we gonna pay for all this eventually? That's the other side. How are we going to raise revenue so that we don't always stand in the position of uh, being severely in debt, whether it's severe or not. Well, and that's going to be the next yeah. problem, right? The next problem, God willing, when we get to the far side of this, is how are we going to raise more revenue? And then we get to all the questions we've always talked about and some new ones. How are we going to do this fairly? I, I hate to bring up what to turn into sounding like a partisan note slightly, but the Senate Majority Leader, who just after presiding after over $1.5 trillion increase in the federal deficit through tax cuts, and then uh, the most recent program that had a lot of money for his little friends, uh, is said that state governments should default uh, well, uh, because we don't want to make the deficit larger. We know perfectly well that he <laughs> does not care about the deficit in the slightest, so I'm driven to wonder if he wants uh, states to put the name itself so that unemployment insurance and Medicaid will be undermined. And the next question is what sort of person would think that way? <laughs> We've been asking that question with respect to many issues that have come before the Senate. No, and I, I, this I, is I, not the forum I, to discuss. <laughs> yes, I agreed. I, sorry, I, I shouldn't have said so, it. So Dan, are you suggesting, go ahead. Uh, so, Dan, are you suggesting that there might not be a consensus on how to raise revenue after the pandemic? Well, I was in the, I was a staffer at Joint Committee 30 years ago, and it was amazing how both the Republicans and the Democrats, despite all the sleaze that is inevitable in the political system on all sides, were both in some ways high-mindedly trying to make the thing work. Uh, it would be nice to be back in that world in some ways. Uh, so, so, go ahead. Oh yeah, so I mean, I, I just wanted to say, I mean, uh, and L L Lori's point on the the fact that we will, over the long term in the country, need a fiscal adjustment, I think is really important. Um, I also just wanted to flag on the other side. Unfortunately, I, I mean, I, I think that if I were to express what I think is the greater risk um, in the next year and a half, two years, it is the possibility of austerity that comes too soon yeah. And in a way that undermines um, people's uh, living standards and a recovery. Um, the CBO today put out, um, you know, a pretty grim uh, projection of the economy over the next year and a half. Um, it's, of course, subject to massive uncertainty. So, you know, take it as just one organization's expected value within a wide range of outcomes. But it showed, even with the fiscal support that we have put in place today, um, they a projected unemployment rate of nine and a half percent at the end of 2021, with the unemployment rate jumping to a high of 16 percent um, in the interim. If that is the projection that ends up bearing out, the economy should be receiving very substantial fiscal support going through the entirety of next year to try to alleviate that massive shortfall in demand um, that they're projecting uh, and the massive pain that um, people are gonna be experiencing. And so, you know, one of the scars of being in government uh, during the last recession 
was the fact that we achieved, that we arrived at austerity too early um, and leaving you know many families experiencing pain that was avoidable. And I think for the next year and a half, that will be a key challenge um, given the political dynamics that we were just discussing. And you're also you're also focusing on the same same group in society. Um, all of us are focusing on the same people who aren't able to get their checks, the same people who are being duped, and the same people uh, for whom austerity will be real. Austerity is going to start on November fourth, I think. No matter who wins the election. Well, we. Some would argue it started. Yeah, that's 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 tr actually true. You're right. All right. So obviously we could. Uh, there's there's much to say in this topic, uh, and uh, you know I look forward to more conversations about this. I think uh, we'll have several months where this will be debated extensively. I, I believe. Uh, but I do want to shift gears a little bit uh, and now uh, send a question uh, to Professor Malman. Um, uh, and you know I, I I I'm new. You know I. I've been at NYU about a week and a half, maybe a little bit longer, but it feels that way uh, sometimes. Um, at one of the questions that we got from uh, uh, the folks out there in the audience was uh, a question about somebody who is uh, 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 the oldest surviving uh, faculty member uh, that you uh, that we know of, uh, and uh, my memory on this is not helpful. Uh, so, Professor Malman, I wonder if you could help us out. I, uh, with, uh, with, with that question from uh, somebody listening in. So we go from substance to whatever. <laughs> so, so I'm very grateful for this question because I'm grateful for what it doesn't ask. Namely, who is the oldest acting uh, person who is uh, currently teaching in the tax program? And Noel, don't smile. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there are a lot of suspects. And I had every intention of looking up whether it would be Carr Ferguson or Guy Maxfield. It's not Victor Zanana and it's not Gardner, I don't think. Um, so I didn't do that. Why didn't I do that? Because I was scrubbing something, probably my hands, like Lady Macbeth or something. Um, so I really don't know the answer to that. I do have an idea which one of us old codgers has been around the longest teaching, <laughs> um, but I'd be willing to defer to my colleagues for the definitive answer on this. Um, so I'm sorry, Stephen. Like I tell my students, not too frequently, hopefully. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't Google, I didn't go to any of the resources. <laughs> That's, I think uh, I think the idea was not necessarily to have a definitive answer. Uh, oh, so. look at this! I just got something. Car is eighty nine. Is this reliable information? Some somebody just on I don't chat. Know. Yeah, on chat. Yeah. Yeah, on chat. Open okay. Your chat. Uh, that's that's uh, that's pretty impressive. That's that and, is and hopefully he'll have an opportunity to get a whole lot older. <laughs> I, I that's I couldn't agree I couldn't agree more. Um, so one of the things that I, I uh, am most um, interested in just as a, as a personal matter, and I think a role that the graduate tax program can play uh, out there in the world, and I think really has played uh, in, a, in an impressive way, uh, is in terms of promoting uh, uh, diversity. So I think one of the big success stories of the program is uh, in what it's done uh, to build a strong cohort uh, of very successful uh, women tax lawyers uh, who, are, who are out there. And, you know, I, I definitely got the sense uh, that this may not have been entirely an accident, Professor Melman. Um, uh, I will take full credit, Stephen. Full credit. <laughs> well, I, I'm just responding to what we heard from uh, the folks who were registered. I mean, that there was a lot of uh, sentiment from folks out there uh, that you uh, converted an entire row of a class uh, into uh, women tax lawyers? I I, that's, that's, that's pretty magical. I don't know how you <laughs> find that. Well, I'd like to take credit for that, and so I will, sitting here in my dining room with the closed doors. Um, <laughs> um, I think that when I, f I, I, I was never a student in the tax program, but I was, um, I am a graduate of the law school's class of 71, I think what we discovered early on was the tax was an area 
where if you knew the answers, that then it really didn't matter what you looked like. Um, and that was very helpful. And making that case uh, from Miranda Stewart to all panelists. <laughs> um, okay, I don't know what that question is, but we can address that. And making that case. Now, I was the first female ever uh, hired for the tax program at the law firm I started out with. Why me? It was a function of the time. I graduated in 71. We were in the middle of the... Vietnam War, everybody was worried they wouldn't be able to fill their places in their law schools, in their firms with men, and so they were willing to take some of us. And you know, it mushroomed from there. It didn't mushroom much, but it, it, it built from there. But we had experiences that we could then uh, impart to other similar individuals that, that it was okay, you could manage, you didn't have to go into trust and estate, sorry and all, but that was the place where you were shunted off to usually. Um, we didn't have to do blue skies work, as these um, state, state uh, laws with respect to corporations and, and, and issuance. Um, and it worked with lifestyles too. So what's happening? What's happening? My cat showed up. <laughs> I knew it was only a matter of time before he would. <laughs> So, sorry. Once wow. your dance is dance. <laughs> and we're and we're I'm never taking class what, without a cat again. But what happened sorry. was also um, there was very much in many endeavors uh, an old boys network, and it was necessary to form a young girls network. And when I did get to NYU to teach, which was awesome and is awesome. Um, I tried to do that. And I know you, Stephen, were referring to a comment maybe by, you know, with respect to JD students, but I made it my business, whether it was appropriate or not, to get together with the women in the tax group. And that worked very, tax students, sorry. And that worked very well. And we built on that. And it was very helpful for people who felt similarly situated to be able to talk to each other. Yeah. And I, I think, uh, obviously, uh, Lori, uh, Mr. Malman gets a lot of the credit, but I know that uh, all of the faculty uh, played a role in this, uh, and it's something that the tax program can be very proud of, I think, uh, something that, that really uh, does it credit. Um, I, I wanted to ask uh, Noel a question now, and again, nobody's asking who is the uh, oldest uh, active uh, faculty member uh, at NYU, that's at the <laughs> table, uh, but... Um, some of the questions, uh, we'll just say that some of the questions that we, we got could only anybody thought be answered by Noel for some reason, for some reason, I don't know why. Um, and one of the questions that we got uh, was about a bottle of scotch. <laughs> was, there, was there a bottle of scotch that made a regular appearance, Noel? I, I'm not quite sure what's happening here. Uh, I think the the reason they may have identified me as a possible uh, person to ask is I might be viewed as a historian because I think of the full-time faculty I've been around the longest. Uh, I arrived uh, in the fall of uh, 1974, graduating in the spring of 75 with the LM in tax. Uh, wonderful experience. And there were two things, two aspects to that experience I could shed some light on. Uh, one is the faculty was absolutely excellent and I can identify some of them if you'd like me to. Uh, but the other thing was that the faculty as a group uh, really wanted to interact and uh, help all of the LLMs have a terrific experience. They, they were active in that and they, and they arranged all sorts of activities and events for us. Uh, and several of the faculty at that time had almost virtually an open door policy for the whole day. Uh, Jerry Wallace in particular uh, arrived in the morning, opened his door, did not close it except for lunch. And students were welcome to come in and discuss whatever with, um, uh, with Jerry. Uh, but if the student wandered into Jerry's office, 
late afternoon or early evening because he was there, the student would probably be offered a chair and a glass of scotch and or Campari, depending on, on, the, on the year. Uh, and uh, Jerry would have one himself and they would toast to whatever uh, the question was at that time. I, that, that, so I, I can say that there is definitely no scotch uh, that I've seen in the program lately. I, what we, what we there are cookies, as you well know. <laughs> Normally, so uh, you know, yes, you I, go, yeah. I, those who those who know me know that uh, I'm a compulsive baker. Um, so uh, they're they're usually cookies if you stop by my office. Uh, but no no scotch that I know of. If I if I find, I'll, I'll let everybody know. Um, and so, but Noel, so you're the historian of of the team here, which I think is wonderful, um, and it's great to have so many folks who have uh, such memories from our most junior uh, panelists, David. Uh, Professor Kamen, uh, to Noel, the one of the longest serving member uh, of the faculty is here. Um, do you feel like, uh, do you feel like um, uh, uh, those, uh, what made the program special uh, years ago remains true or has it changed? Uh, wh what are the attributes of uh, Victor Zanana, George Zeitlin, Marty Ginsburg, Guy May Mayfield, uh, Carr Ferguson, you mentioned earlier, Jim Eusis, what are, what are the aspects of what they brought to the program that are still part of the program today? Uh, I think uh, two things. Uh, one, um, the faculty when I was here was absolutely excellent. Um, to just to just identify a couple of, uh, of them. Uh, Jerry Wallace founded the, founded the uh, program in 1945, I guess. Uh, and he was very distinguished both in the government played football at Illinois and uh, was a law professor at, at Yale before he came. Um, his, his, uh, his partner was really Charlie Lyon, who had as well an extremely uh, distinguished government uh, background. He was among other things, the deputy chief prosecutor at Nuremberg. Um, then there was uh, Jim Eustace, who uh, when I arrived, he was still, um, fairly young, he was running marathons uh, like crazy, but he was already a superstar substantively in, in corporate tax mostly. But until 1974, it was thought by most tax lawyers that he knew everything. Uh, I think it was the uh, ERISA, which was 1975. He said he threw in the towel. He just wasn't gonna go there. He was gonna let someone else uh, handle that. Um, and then Carr Ferguson, uh, who three years later was uh, appointed Assistant Attorney General for Tax. Uh, these are very distinguished people. And the younger people were rising stars. They, they were Victor Zanana, Bill Hutton, um, and Michael Rollison, who went on to a uh, high government position. So that was, uh, that was just an excellent faculty, probably more interested in practice than in policy, but very interested in policy too. Um, so they were there. And also uh, David mentioned this earlier about his class of 09. Um, my classmates were absolutely terrific. And they were somewhat intimidating. Uh, I had been taught tax law before I came to NYU by looking at the cases and the code. And all of a sudden, my classmates were uh, citing what I thought were obscure regulations. I wasn't even sure it re related to regulations because I'm not so sure I read one before I arrived. Um, and so they were there. And the um, faculty really cared about the students as well. Today, I think the faculty is at least as good. Uh, it's a little bit different. I think we're a little bit more interested as a group on policy issues and where the tax law might go, a little bit less uh, on the practice. But just, just the uh, panelists who were here, I think we care about our students just as much as Jerry and his cohort uh, cared about uh, us. Thank you. Uh, and, um, you know, everybody else is welcome to weigh in as well. Uh, I know uh, Noel has the longest memory perhaps, but, um, I did also want to ask Noel uh, one, one more question. Um, 
what would you say, uh, you, so you led the program for years. You've been uh, involved with the program for much longer than that. What do you think the program is going to look like in 25 years? And maybe, you know, we're uh, getting a preview of it now. Uh, so much of what's happening uh, this semester uh, is now virtual, right? The medium we're using now, Zoom, uh, to connect, although we do it in an interactive way with our students, is happening. Do you think that uh, 25 years from now, uh, if uh, Jerry Wallace were to walk into uh, a NYU uh, graduate tax program class, uh, would he recognize it? <laughs> well, I don't know if I recognize it on Zoom. I, I'm doing Zoom the first, uh, uh, this is the first semester I've done that. That's quite different. I uh, have to get used to it. Uh, my own personal preference is to have uh, uh, actual human beings in the room when I'm trying to teach. So I'd have to get used to that. But I think the program, um, I, I hope, retains the values that I've already expressed. Uh, I think it's going to change as the law changes, as the policy behind the law changes. And it's actually not for me to make that call. I've made over the course of <laughs> many years, several calls, but right now, I quite honestly, I think the call on what the program should look like uh, belongs to David, Lily, Dan, and Mitchell. And Laurie and I might have views, but uh, uh, I think we'll be, uh, uh, we'll, we'll be long gone by then. Well, it's, uh, you know, I'm not excited about you guys being long gone, but it is exciting to think about what the program might look like in 25 years. It's, it's uh, you know, 75 years is a long time. Uh, and so much of what is true about the program, what was great about the program then is great now. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see what the new strengths are. I know uh, David has a few exciting uh, projects up his sleeve. I won't uh, make him do any unveiling now, but I know he's got some exciting stuff that's, uh, that's happening. Um, but I also wanted to uh, ask uh, Dan uh, now. So one of the things that's made the program uh, great uh, over the past quarter century uh, that maybe Jerry Wallace might not have recognized uh, is the tax policy colloquium uh, that Dan has been running for 25 years uh, and that Lily Batchelder uh, has recently joined him uh, as the co-convener for. Uh, but as far as I know, there are no feline co-conveners. Yeah, my cat seems to want to participate, but... Uh... but you know, that's, I think it's the, the colloquium that drew uh, the cat in. Um, so <laughs> last, last fall uh, was the 25th Colloquium is that's right. Did I get that right, Dan? Yeah. Well, I I've I've been at every single session of the last twenty five years, except one when I had a death in the family, one when I had the flu, the regular flu, and one when I actually did uh, had an engagement somewhere else. So I let my colleague do it. I don't know if I'll be here for the entire next twenty five years, uh, but certainly I'm planning to start out strong. And unfortunately, we may be doing it on Zoom initially, but we'll. I don't think we'll be having dinners where we try to kind of bring the whole thing together. But other than that, the colloquium goes on. So and, and I know you were talking to me about when it started, I guess. So yeah. I, I, would, I would like to uh, talk about um, uh, where it started. Uh, but I, I would also just be curious to uh, hear, and I, I suspect a lot of the folks out there who uh, uh, either weren't able to participate because uh, they graduated in the 60s, as some of our uh, audience members did. I, I, I'm not great at math, but I think that's longer than 25 years ago. Um, uh, so uh, for those folks who uh, weren't, uh, had the program before or you got here, Dan, um, uh, I think they might be interested to know uh, what it is that the colloquium offers our students and why it's been so popular over the years. Well, it's, I, I think of it as uh, we try to be at least initially unique. Of course, people do the same thing as us, I guess that affects it in a lot of ways. One is we really try to be interdisciplinary and reach many audiences at the same time. We want to have a, a serious academic conversation with law professors. We want our students to be fully involved. They're interested practitioners who come frequently. They're economists or political scientists, whatever, depending on the subject. We're trying to be both very advanced and very serious and yet completely accessible. And if uh, the speaker, maybe I make this mistake myself sometimes, but if a speaker uses jargon, and jargon's not a bad thing, it's just a shorthand for something, I try to make sure that the people in the room know what it's about. So our aim is really to have a serious conversation 
not just about, gee, is this a good paper or not, but about the topic that the paper is talking about. And the aim is really to uh, come have all of us not be gladiatorial, but have all of us come out with a better understanding of the issues that the paper is about. And either we agree now or else if we disagree, we have a better understanding of why we disagree and what other people think. So we really are, it's, it's sort of an effort to do many things at the same time, to be like, again, to be totally accessible and hopefully the students and everyone in the room can follow it and find it interesting, but also to really advance thinking. And I think maybe the proof that we've succeeded a little bit is that it's certainly been much imitated uh, by law schools around the country. It, that that uh, imitation is a sincere form of flattery, and you've been flattered, yes. Dan. Um, what, what I wanted to ask you, uh, and you can take this either direction, uh, I would like to hear either about your favorite uh, presenter uh, or the worst presenter you've ever had. Well, I'll talk about uh, yeah, you had uh, a couple of my favorite moments. I think my favorite moment, the one, the moment I came close, the only time I ever appeared to be a dean candidate, to those who didn't know what was going on, was uh, Ed Kleinbart had never been there before. And we always have everyone introduce themselves at the start, but he came 10 minutes late. And just as it happened, I was uh, praising to the skies an article by Kleinbart uh, that day. It's something he wrote while he was at, at Cleary about what are called cubbyholes in tax, and how, for example, there's an infinity, a continuous infinity of possible financial transactions, but we say this is debt, and that's equity and so forth. And I'm praising Kleinbard, and so this is a great article, it really has insights. And meanwhile, this guy is talking out, but he, he hadn't introduced himself, he came in late, but others had called him Eddie, which is rather strange. Anyway, I finally said to him, I I'm sorry, who are you? And he said, I'm Ed Kleinbard. And the whole room laughed. And uh, uh, someone said to me afterwards, "Did you? if you knew it was him, you should be the dean. <laughs> and I said, no, unfortunately, I'm not that good. I, I I was only able to pretend not to know because I really didn't. Uh, so that's, that was sort of a favorite moment. That, that is that is pretty amazing. Um, so I know we're getting pretty uh, late in the hour, uh, and I did want to make sure that we had a chance to answer for everybody, if they can, uh, to weigh in on a question that I think uh, Lori uh, had uh, sort of foreshadowed earlier in the conversation. But I want to start with uh, with Dan this time. Um, what do, so uh, somebody asked uh, what direction uh, the panelists think that tax policy is going to take uh, uh, federal tax legislation in a post COVID nineteen world? Um, uh, so we're, they're just everybody out there wants to know what you guys think, and I understand why. What do you guys think is going to happen in federal tax uh, going forward, Dan? Well, I don't know what's going to happen because it's so dependent on the politics. And I think the politics we have in the country today is so crazy and dysfunctional, and there's a chance it'll get worse. But if any sort of rational process survives uh, this year, then at some point, once we're past the worst of it, there's going to be need for revenue, obviously. And uh, there are actually a lot of decent revenue sources out there that are under tapped. We don't have a VAT in this country. We don't have a carbon tax. It's been discussed widely that uh, there are a lot of what are called, you know, economists call rents being earned, extra normal returns. There's actually a lot of, of uh, not quite money on the table because taxing always has leads to distortions, but there's a lot of revenue sources out there. But the problem is it's easily demagogued against and also it, it, a lot of it comes from powerful people. And uh, so it's really going to be a challenge whether we, ha we have uh, a failed state or a country that can still try to deal with these problems. And if we do have a country that can still deal with the problems, there's a lot of, uh, none of it is fun because no one likes paying taxes, but there are a lot of revenue sources that are not crazy that are out there. And the revenue sources that have been discussed at the highest level for many years with proposals like the VAT. 30, 40 years, many yeah. of them, yeah. So do you, do you think we might end up with a VAT after this? Uh, I, I always used to think that it would happen someday, but I kind of don't anymore. Uh, I wrote a piece where I kind of said, the problem is uh, it's kind of like both liberals and conservatives are risk averse because for each one, for each side, if we get the VAT and we use it our way, we make the system better than it was before, but the other guys will think it's worse and vice versa. In other words, on the left, there'd be an appeal to using a VAT to pay for more social insurance. On the right, there'd be an appeal to using a VAT uh, to pay for less income taxation. 
and getting rid of wealth tax, uh, any talk of wealth taxation. But the problem is for each side, the VAT plus the other side's uh, uh, uses of it make it worse. So everyone's scared. Like, what if we get the VAT and we can't use it our way? It gets used the other guy's way. So that's a big problem, I think. One reason we don't get a VAT, among many. Uh, no, so, uh, David? Do you have any thoughts uh, on what might happen in tax legislation after an older mm -hmm. So I'll, I'm, I'm happy to go first. Uh, before, um, so, you know, I, I think that there is a question on how um, the country makes long term adjustments, um, which are going to be on in light in all likelihood over the long term. It's not necessary mm -hmm. immediately on, you know, on the order of several percentage yeah. points of GDP. Um, I tend to be of the view that I hope that most of that adjustment happens on the revenue side. And as Dan said, there are ways to do that. I think in terms of, you know, the most likely prospects for more immediate legislation, and I don't think those kinds of adjustments are likely to happen immediately. And in fact, given what's going on with the economy, probably shouldn't. Um, but I do think that it depends on the political dynamics. It depends, basically it depends if there's unified control of Congress and the president by one party or the other. Um, if in the case of unified democratic control um, going into next year, I think it's possible um, that you would, you would actually see some significant reform of taxation of capital and wealth. Um, you know, obviously there's been a bit before the COVID um, crisis, there was a big debate about wealth taxes and, um, you know, what that looks like. Also Wyden introduced his mark to market white paper. At the very least, I think it is fair to say um, that in, with, if there were unified democratic control, step up and basis at death actually might have, there might be a chant, real shot at reform by the, you know, Biden's position, um, which was sort of the more, the, the, the least dramatic of any of those during the primary campaign was realization at death. A um, proposal that, you know, several years ago would have, been widely applauded by academics, but was not widely embraced by policymakers. So I think that's an area where there's, you know, could well be some significant legislation with unified control. And then, you know, and this is not, we, we are missing our international specialists. The international tax system seems uh, somewhat unstable at the moment. <laughs> and it would not surprise me if you saw some significant legislation, whether under um, Republican or Democratic administrations, potentially even with um, mixed control of Congress and the White House. Yeah, I guess um, I, I agree with everything that's been said. The one thing I'd like personally to um, um, for a Democratic um, uh, administration to work on would be uh, wealth taxes of, of some sort. Um, we could and we need to reform the, our, our current estate and gift if we're going to keep it. But there are lots of proposals out there that are worth looking at. Uh, and I'd like to see some action in that area. Um, Lily Batchelder, our colleague, has been working on an inheritance tax as a substitute for that. And then there's Warren's variations on the, on the wealth tax. And I think all of those should be on the table uh, uh, to address many many problems, especially the growing inequality we're having in this country. Interesting. Any, any more uh, thoughts on substance? I, I like that we actually talked about a specific code section, uh, 1014. That was, that was cool. Um, uh, so that's, that is, that is how we, that is what we do. That is what we are all about. Um, so that, that's great. Uh, any other thoughts folks wanted to share with uh, the hundreds of people out there who are virtually gathered today to, uh, I think can talk about tax. I do wonder if even if, if the Democrats get control of Congress, even if they don't pass a wealth tax, if they're going to be constitutional challenges of a sort that were not kind of expected, uh, uh, few, would not have been expected a few years ago. But that's just something we'll have to see. In other words, mark to market, things that most of us, despite Eisner and McCumber, have become persuaded are clearly constitutional. I wonder if it might all be up for grabs and there might be some surprising uh, strike downs, even if they don't go wealth tax, which everyone re recognizes would raise a you know, big constitutional issue. I, my, my answer to Dan, well, in one word is yes. I think that we are likely to see such litigation. And um, I mean, my sense is that 
uh, staff on the Hill are aware of the, like are, are aware. Um, and, and that, but, but we've, we've seen a polarization on litigation and the way courts handle um, some, some of these issues. And so, yeah, I, I think it is, it, it's, it's, a, it's an important issue where this may not just get litigated in Congress and unfortunately, in my view, very unfortunately might get litigated in the courts in ways that are, um, could potentially be pretty unreasonable. And when when the court does weigh in, you never quite know what is going to happen. Do you have do you have uh, bets on uh, if the court heard uh, the current court uh, heard a challenge to the wealth tax, uh, which way would come out? I I love that there are such different uh, views among academics. Uh, uh, is is one side right or wrong? It really depends on what your theory of constitutional law is, which no one can, no one has convincingly specified to universal satisfaction yet. <laughs> is anybody willing to uh, guess as to what the current court would do if presented with this, or is that just unknowable? I think the current court, there's simply no doubt that the five of them would vote that it's unconstitutional. I mean, I, I bet on almost any odds. Uh, the real question is whether they will strike down other things like uh, mark to market or something like that. Uh, so, so when uh, constitutional scholars like Bruce Ackerman uh, seem totally untroubled by uh, that question, uh, uh, you just you just aren't, aren't buying it, Dan? No, what I'm saying is that the current court is uh, the five know what they want to do and they're going to do it. Uh, and in, in, in this question, it's clear there are reasonable arguments on both sides. Uh, and the fact they're willing, they might be willing to go without a reasonable argument on their side, but given that they have one, uh, they're definitely going to use it. Someone like Ackerman is addressing what he thinks is the correct interpretation of constitutional law. Uh, but that's not really the conversation. That's not really what the five are that interested in. It's sort of interesting that even as, as Dan's talking about uh, the constitutionality of mark to market or the, the health of Eisner v. McComber or, or constitutionality of a wealth tax, everything that we talk about ends up being a discussion of politics. Everything that we talk about is ultimately very politically charged, which is very unfortunate. And that's not gonna change if the Supreme Court is as it is today. Um, if, if our view is, and maybe I'm, I'm overstating the fact that it's a political view that certain justices have, um, maybe it is just their, their view of their role and the role of courts and the role of constitution or whatever. Um, but it seems to me it all goes back to the same thing, which is really, I don't know if it's terrifying, but it's so sad. Uh, it's uh, interesting times uh, for those who are focused on tax and uh, everybody else as well. Well, I, I wanna thank uh, the four of you, the, uh, <laughs> more than 100 of years uh, participants uh, in uh, tonight's event. Um, uh, so excited. I, I wanted to just, uh, on a personal note, um, thank, uh, and I'm not gonna name names because I will forget many people, uh, but I wanna thank uh, the folks who have uh, helped train me uh, and teach me in so many ways at uh, different places I've worked and um, uh, studied. So I started out in tax KPMG. They're the ones who made me sit in tax. Uh, then uh, my uh, professors at Yale, uh, both the full-time and visiting faculty, uh, the wonderful lawyers I worked with at Cravath, uh, and then at Deba Boys, and then faculty at Brooklyn Law School, uh, and most especially uh, to the faculty uh, and uh, the rest of the team at NYU Law uh, that has made me feel uh, so welcome uh, over the past year plus, uh, and to all the uh, alums that I've met uh, and all the alums that I would like to meet going forward uh, I, you know, that's not going to happen in the short term, I know, uh, but hopefully uh, uh, there'll be more opportunities to uh, get together and connect and have the kind of conversations uh, we did today. I, I want all of you to reach out uh, to your former uh, faculty members uh, and your classmates and, uh, you know, listen to the podcast, The Tax Maven, uh, while you're sheltering at home uh, and uh, uh, reach out to uh, uh, folks and connect. And I'll say that I am not a Scotch guy. Uh, I, I'm from the Bahamas, so I, I, uh, have, <laughs> I have a little bit of rum here. It kind of looks Scotch-like, right, I guess. Uh, so hey, could I have this? Could I? Could you hand it over? Yeah, here we go. Here we go. 
Uh, I just wanted to raise a glass uh, to, you know, an incredible uh, team at NYU Law and Tax, uh, an incredible group of alums out there, uh, and all the past uh, faculty members, administrators who made it great. Uh, 75 years is an incredible achievement. Uh, and the, uh, the, Dan said the colloquium has been imitated. Uh, uh, the graduate tax program uh, has been uh, flattered the heck out of uh, by uh, countless imitators. Uh, so I think uh, kudos go to you guys for keeping it strong, uh, for those who made it great in the past, uh, and for those yet to come. Uh, so I hope all of you out there uh, today will raise it, <laughs> whatever you've got, or raise your hand. Uh, oh, coffee. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, enjoy. Uh, you guys should all be very proud of what you've helped create and build and maintain. Uh, and I, I'm looking forward to uh, spending more time uh, with all of you out there in the world. Uh, and then also, um, uh, <laughs> um, and then the, um, uh, there, there was a, uh, a question about tax faculty jocks, which I don't think we do. I, I'm not sure whether I read that right, uh, but I, I didn't quite get this. So we'll just let that one go. Uh, but thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you faculty for taking time. Uh, and I hope everybody is well and stays safe and healthy. Uh, please stay in touch. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.